Well, welcome to the wonderful session on ancient India with Upinda Singh. We hope very much to have her with us at the festival, but sadly, circumstances have dictated otherwise, and it's uh, it's on Zoom. Uh, but I would uh, recommend this book beyond uh, all recommending. I read it on the beach at Christmas uh, in Goa, uh, and it is as gripping as any novel, but uh, in uh, livened by a lifetime of profound scholarship on ancient India. And uh, uh, that's, in a sense, the first thing I want to ask you, Yupinda, the idea of writing for a general audience. You say, uh, on, on the second page of the book, you say how, um, and I was very interested in this, you said that um, a great deal of popular interest in ancient India these days uh, and the fact that the subject is a political mine and minefield makes it more urgent than ever to move discussions out of universities and academic journals and into the wider world. Do you think Indian academics in general have been very slow to do that? Absolutely, um, William. Uh, I think things are changing now, but uh, it's taken some time for us to get here. I myself have actually always been interested in writing for a general audience. One of my early books, Ancient Delhi, was for a general audience. I, I wrote a book for- That's book of yours I bought, I think, I remember, with wonderful descriptions of diggings and lalcott and, and full of stuff that you could find nowhere else. Still yes. very relevant and interesting for people. Yes, and I also wrote a book for children many years ago on archeological sites in India. So although I've been an academic teaching in St. Stephen's College, Delhi University, and now Ashoka University, I've always had a, a sense of the importance of writing for general readers. I think it's also because I've been an undergraduate teacher for most of my career. And I think that gears you towards talking uh, to an audience and talking to a readership uh, that can understand you in a way that they can connect with, uh, in a way that interests them. But you're right, uh, historians by and large, professional historians in India, uh, have for the most part been talking to each other, to a very small um, audience, uh, and uh, the debates take place within this group. And, and it's really high time that um, we broke through this barrier. Why do you think this was? Because when you go to somewhere like America, you find that, you know, the greatest Shakespearean uh, in the world, Stephen Greenblatt, uh, his copy, his book, The Swerve, both won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and was read by a million people. Uh, but there's been nothing, while Indian fiction fiction writers have been very quick to spread around the world and engage their work uh, with, 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 with a, a general intelligent audience. We haven't seen Indian academics triumph in the non-fiction field in the same way that uh, uh, they have in, uh, Indian writers have in fiction. And, and it seems a very strange absence. I think it has to do with a certain academic snobbishness. If you write something um, that is readable, that is engaging, that is interesting, uh, which doesn't have a million footnotes that people can understand and enjoy. Uh, there's always, you know, you run the risk of being accused of not uh, producing solid work. Uh, so I think that may be the reason why uh, very few professional historians in India have uh, actively written for uh, a general audience. In, in I think things are changing. In my world, in, the, in colonial history and 18th and 19th century, I always wondered whether it was the dominance of Marxist historians in India, in the sense that Marxist historians stress um, social and economic processes, that uh, the uh, biography is, uh, is, is, in a sense, looked down on, that rather like uh, the Tolstoy own view of history, um, historical processes are regarded as, as you know, great invisible movements beneath the, uh, beneath the surface of the earth, and that uh, people play a, a minor part in, in Marxist history. While the kind of history that, that often engages people as readers is, is, is history that's full of people, that's, that's biographically based, that is full of characters, good and bad, and, and, and except, you know, written in, in nonfiction with, 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 with proper um, uh, with, 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 with proper research. Do you feel that's a factor or not? Well, I do think that uh, left historians uh, did dominate the writing of history, including ancient Indian history for many decades. Uh, I think in order to be uh, 
you know, give a fair, balanced view, uh, one does have to acknowledge that uh, they did make important inter interventions in shifting the focus away from political events to understanding political processes, social and economic history, all of which I think are very important. Uh, also, they're the ones who brought in uh, <clears throat> marginalized and subordinated social group, which I think is a very important part of any but ironically, those, those subaltern studies papers, you know, while academically excellent and, and bringing in the subaltern excluded everybody at the same time by being written in the densest academic prose that was uh, almost incomprehensible to anyone that hadn't sort of gone on a course to understand this, this, this separate language that it was written in. Well, that's a question of style. In my view, uh, yeah. you know, I, I would love to write in a way that historians and non-historians lay readers should be able to understand everything. So I think clarity is a very important quality uh, in any kind of historical writing. But, you know, going back to your question, of course, there was a domination of left historians for many decades, from the 60s to the, I would say, till certainly the late 80s. In fact, I was an undergraduate student. I grew up under the shadow of that kind of leftist domination. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, apart from the kind of positives, of course, the, the casualties of that phase was the fact um, that religion, for instance, uh, was not given the importance that it deserved. Um, aspects of what we might loosely describe as culture, uh, art and architecture, which interests me a great deal, these were given short shrift. But, I mean, I don't think, but I don't think that is the reason why historians in India have not been writing for ordinary people. I don't think that really connects with, you know, the, the part of your question where you're asking why uh, historians have been writing. And, you know, for you talk about biography, but in ancient India, <clears throat> you know, people are very difficult to find. Individuals are very difficult to find. It has been tried. My friend Nanjot has written a biography of Ashoka. But, uh, you know, the further back in time you go, the more you're dealing with communities, groups of people, the individual becomes very, very difficult to locate. Um, I read exactly the same observation recently, um, what you said that, that, that one of the problems with Marxist history in an Indian context is, is the, the way that it uh, doesn't take religion seriously, uh, or doesn't write it as a primary mover in history, as a, one of the motivators of mankind. And um, Hamantri Prabhuray was writing this very much in, in her book, a recent book on, uh, on, on coastal shrines and so on. And she was saying how uh, the Indian temple has always been seen as an economic unit, uh, or even or just something that legitimizes kings, rather than obviously a religious center for a community and and something which you know was a major cultural center as well. That's true. Historians have been obsessed with legitimation for a very long time, and I think that has prevented them. I mean, legitimation is an important part of historical processes, but uh, that doesn't mean you don't look at the content of religious ideas, practices. It doesn't mean that you don't uh, you know examine. Uh, the different manifestations of power, whether they're visual or whether in the form of inscriptions or whether they're, they're textual. So uh, certainly that has been, um, it's, that is part of the uh, left uh, writings, I think of the 1960s and 70s particularly. Uh, but I think things are changing now. And I think um, right now, uh, the, uh, the future, I think, of good, for good history writing really lies in a group of historians, and there are many, and I consider myself as one of them, who are not aligned to the left or to the right. I, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. Let's go through your wonderful book, um, which is, is really kind of five freestanding essays on different aspects of ancient India. I'm longing to see, there's a very wonderful visual component to your book, and I'm very keen to get that in uh, before the session closes. But um, should we just go through the five chapters very briefly uh, and what, so you can lay out your stool, so to speak, of, of, of the, the issues you're discussing? First of all, one of the things that you um, say, uh, and I think it's a wonderful and, and fascinating point, it's, it's there at the beginning and the end of your book, is the idea that you know, there are some versions of ancient India where people often who have not studied ancient India, but, but just uh, get it from, a, uh, from um, uh, vague ideas of the epics and so on, imagine ancient India to be this wonderful utopia, uh, non-violent, uh, full, uh, full of sort of glamour. And um, you put it very nicely. I'll try and find the, uh, the passage here um, where you say, um, 
many distorted views of the past emerge from presentism. That is judging and using the past to serve the agendas of the present. The image of ancient India as a utopia of social and religious harmony and nonviolence is a false one. Do you want to comment on that? Well, this actually connects with my previous book. Uh, you know, I worked on political violence, violence in India, and that book came out in uh, 2017. And Wonderful. in that book, I, 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 I looked very carefully at uh, debates about violence and nonviolence in uh, ancient Indian texts, inscriptions as expressed in visual sources between about 600 BCE to 600 CE. And uh, what I, uh, you know, I haven't developed that in Culture of Contradictions, but there is a very detailed analysis of how, um, you know, along with the increase of different forms of political violence in ancient India, whether it is warfare or the use of coercion to extract uh, taxes from farmers or the use of violence and force in the administration of justice, along with these processes, what we can see are increasingly sophisticated attempts to try to conceal and to mask the, the, the violence. And uh, so that, that is something I've developed in that book. And uh, what I also try to uh, explain is that this idea of India and Indians as being intrinsically nonviolent is completely false. There's so much violence in our present, plenty of violence of all kinds in our past, and, um, you know, I really don't know where this idea of Indians being intrinsically nonviolent has come from. And I think it really has to do with the importance of nonviolence in Gandhian nationalism. It has to do with the fact that we have icons of nonviolence. We have Ashok, we have Buddha, we have Mahavir, and we forget everything that comes in between. So there's a certain amnesia, an amazing amnesia about the violence, enormous amount of violence in Indian history, at and the same time, yes. Sorry, very interesting that you say that because we had this morning a session by this young historian, Anirudh Kanasetti, uh, talking mm -hmm. about um, uh, the, the, the early medieval Deccan. Uh, and one of his points was that um, you get Jain generals, aristocratic warrior Jain generals, who boast in inscriptions at Savannah Belagola about the piles of skulls that they're assembling of their enemies, which again is not at all our image of a peaceful Jain, Jain religion. Well, that's true. You have Carvel, who in the second century BCE um, talked about his uh, devout belief in Jainism and at the same time boasted about all his military victories. So we shouldn't actually find all this surprising, should we? But one of the things that I loved in your previous book, in, in the, uh, the, the violence book, uh, was the comparison you made between Ashoka's voice on the pillar inscriptions, uh, who does very strongly make this point about um, after his victory of the Gligas and, and, and later in his life about nonviolence, and you compare it to the way, to the voice of the Assyrians and the Persians, um, who are, are sort of extravagantly violent. And, and you have, I mean, anyone that goes around the British Museum or the Louvre and looks at those Assyrian reliefs of people being impaled in their thousands and cities being assaulted and um, the captives being led away with halters around their neck. I mean, there is something quite different um, going on here. I agree completely. I think Ashok was a remarkable emperor, remarkable for his time. And I think if you placed him in 2022, he'd, he'd look remarkable too, because here you have a, a ruler who is, um, not at boasting about his military victories, uh, who is in fact in his 13th Rock Edict, which I think is an inscription that every Indian, not only every Indian, but everybody uh, in the world should read. It's a remarkable uh, statement made by a third century BCE emperor in which he is expressing regret and remorse for a particular war and on that basis generalizing and putting forward a series of statements and arguments really about why war is bad, why the evils of war and why the suffering of war uh, extends far beyond the people who suffer directly. So uh, Ashok is quite remarkable for his time and uh, there's no doubt about it, not only in the 13th Rock Edict, but his concern for animals uh, and uh, so on and so forth. The, one of the things you discuss in, in the book very interestingly is the question of how Buddhist rulers have, in this, and Jain rulers presumably, uh, by the same token, have to make their peace with violence because it, it, you cannot rule 
uh, in this in this uh, flawed world we live in, um, without some measure of violence. And and yet and, and so you find Buddhist rulers having to convolutedly um, come to ways of, of 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 justifying violence in their regimes. That's true. Even a Ashok, pacifist that he was, uh, did in that very inscription in which he talks so feelingly about his renunciation of war. Uh, in that same inscription, he gives a very stern warning to the forest people and tells them you better watch out because if you don't behave yourself, I, you know, I, I'm going to get you. So there is a strong element of pragmatism uh, that is visible. Uh, and that's not surprising, isn't it? Politicians have always been pragmatic. And why should we expect ancient uh, rulers to be otherwise? One single just line that caught my attention was I'd always been brought up with the idea that uh, it was Buddhists who introduced vegetarianism to India and that uh, pre before, Ashok, again, I think probably from the Ashoka inscriptions where he says previously in the palace kitchens, 5,000 deer were slaughtered a day, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and I had taken that to mean that it was a very you know, meat eating culture before Ashoka and, and vegetarian after. But you say that's not true. Well, Ashok uh, talks quite disarmingly about his attempts to introduce vegetarianism in the royal household. And I'm pretty sure that there must have been some queens and princes who must have been very irked by these uh, dietary regulations. And he admits that he wasn't able to actually uh, completely ban or you know, stop meat eating in the royal household. He also boasts about having made the fishermen stop fishing and the hunters uh, he says in my empire have stopped hunting. So obviously these are very exaggerated uh, notions about the effectiveness of his own personal uh, commitment to ahimsa or, or nonviolence. But you know, Buddhism is uh, often connected erroneously with vegetarianism and vegetarian is very often erroneously equated with nonviolence. I mean, a lot of the discussion that we see in the public domain uh, has to do with food, what people eat and what they don't eat. And um, if you look at the early Buddhist texts, it's quite evident uh, that vegetarianism was not a, a, a precept that was uh, essential for uh, Buddhist monks and nuns. And uh, the Buddha himself is known to have eaten meat and his last meal uh, seems to have been basically a meal, uh, something consisting, some dish consisting of bad meat that led to him falling seriously ill and then eventually dying of the illness. So we, in a sense, we, we've jumped ahead to the um, fourth chapter of your book. Which, let's go back to the beginning, Inequality and Salvation. I, again, one of the surprises, I'd always assumed, following Meg uh, Megasthenes, that uh, India had no slavery. You say that it did have slavery in ancient India. There's absolutely no doubt, William. There's so many references to slaves, male and female slaves, dasas and dasis from the Vedic texts onwards. Megasthenes, by the way, got a couple of things wrong, several things wrong. And, uh, you know, one could write another book on that. Say it very explicitly after a visit to India, there are no slaves, if slaves were uh, around. Well, he did make many other mistakes. Okay? He talks about the seven classes that Indian society is, you know, is divided into. And he makes a lot of uh, statements which are clearly factually incorrect. So there's absolutely no reason uh, to go by what Megasthenes says uh, on, on, on each and every point. Some of his contemporaries uh, were also a bit skeptical about the veracity of his statements in general. Um, and again, go, go into the, the whole argument that you have in your uh, extraordinary book about inequality in, in ancient India. It is, it is an unusually stratified society. All societies are stratified in all times, in all parts of the world. It's the nature of the stratification that can vary. And what I've discussed in this particular chapter in the book are uh, certain um, you know, institutions that are uh, peculiar to India. So I've talked about Varna, I've talked about caste or Jati, but you know, class divisions are found everywhere. They're not you know, particular. Uh, to India. Slavery is, has been very widely pervasive uh, across the world for many, many centuries. But Varna and Jati and, and the practice of untouchability, I, I, I did feel that it was important for general readers to know about the early history of these practices and these ideas. 
And again, you said that, that Buddhism offers salvation, but not social equality. The Buddhists were not also uh, after a single uh, equal society. Certainly not. I think the dukkha or the suffering that the Buddha was talking about had to do essentially with the inner world uh, and not with the outer world. And uh, what you find happening is that the Sangha, the Buddhist monastic order, um, emerges as a sort of oasis of equality in the midst of a very unequal world. And the Buddha never sought to change those uh, unequal relationships. Uh, you do have some element of critique of inequality, uh, uh, insistence that it is a person's character, personality, uh, the qualities that he or she has that are the true judge of his or her merit and it isn't birth. But uh, you also find a certain acceptance of the status quo. So slaves can't join the Sangha unless they are freed from their masters. Debtors cannot join the Sangha until they're, uh, those they're in, de in debt to uh, um, let them go off, so on and so forth. You have references, don't you, to Buddhist monasteries owning slaves? Well, yes. Large numbers of slaves. Yes, because if monks did not uh, actually participate, they did not engage directly in agriculture. And some of these monasteries were huge. They had huge landed estates. Obviously, they needed uh, slaves and they had to hire, uh, you know, wage labor in order to actually uh, maintain their large landed estates. I was very struck by also, you said that some of the Alva and Nainma saints were from, from a Dalit, from an untouchable background. I don't that is true. The Brahmins. Uh, well, you know, you, what we find is in, across the board, you do find an upper class domination. For instance, even if you look at the Buddhist and Jain monastic orders, there, you know, you do find Brahmins actually dominating, uh, appearing in a very big way in the Buddhist and Jain uh, monastic orders. And similarly, when you look at later bhakti, um, you do find, uh, actually, in the Bhakti movement, there's a much greater variety of occupations and social backgrounds that are reflected. But there, there are some, there are a few uh, Alvar and Nayanmar saints who do uh, belong to so-called untouchable uh, backgrounds. Let's move on now to chapter two, Desire and Detachment, where, where you write about love. And, and you start very sweetly with this, with the oldest piece of love graffiti in, uh, in India. Can you talk about that? Well, this is the chapter I enjoyed writing the most because, uh, yes, the Jogi Mara cave inscription, a very short inscription, very poignant, uh, in which um, uh, there is a kind of expression of mysterious love, really. Uh, for a woman named uh, Sutanaka, expressed by a man named De Devadinna. And this inscription has always captivated me. And I use that as a way of entering. Date when, what date is it? It would be around the second century BCE, third or second century BCE. So the, you actually have a, a, a bit of love, graffiti of the sort we see scribbled on every wall in Delhi. That's dating. right. That, that's right. But I went on from there to uh, talk about uh, ancient Indian love poetry in Tamil, Prakrit, the Gatha Satasai. I find the Gatha Satasai love poems some of the most beautiful love poems I've ever read. And then I also talk about Kalidas and the Sanskrit poets. Beautifully. As the traveler eyes raised, cupped hands filled with water, spreads his fingers and let it run through. She pouring it reduces the trickle. There's some lovely, lovely lines like that. I highly, highly recommend this. But one thing that I was interested in is it, it sometimes seems surprising to us that, that ancient India is so overtly sexual. And yet, surely this was true of, of also of ancient Rome, of ancient Greece. The odd, the odd one, I mean, the odd thing is, in a sense, how unsexual uh, medieval Christian culture was, which, uh, which sort of nixed this uh, much more open attitude to sexuality that you get everywhere before the rise of the Abrahamic religions. That is correct to some extent, William, but uh, what I've tried to show in uh, my chapter on desire and detachment is that you can have, and we do see different attitudes towards love and sex uh, coexisting at the same time. 
And on the one hand, you have a celebration of love and love poetry and drama. You have the Kama Sutra. So there is, you know, uh, Kama is the subject of serious study. And on the other hand, you have a very, very powerful um, kind of, uh, should I call it a movement or an, a, a cultural attitude that sees attachment of any kind, a desire of any kind as an impediment to the attainment of the highest goal. So the importance, the centrality of renunciation, which had a very negative attitude towards love, desire, sex, attachment of any kind, that coexists uh, with all that sensuous and sensual and erotic sculpture and, and poetry. That's why I've called this book Culture of Contradictions. These contradictions existed simultaneously then, as they do even now. Do you have any um, sense that it is Indian asceticism which travels westwards? Because it's, it's centuries later that we get groups like the Essenes uh, in, in the Judean desert and then the Christian monks doing very similar things, living in caves, rejecting the world, rejecting, uh, embracing celibacy and so on. Is this an Indian, I mean, uh, the Kama Sutra traveled later westwards, but uh, uh, do we see Indian asceticism traveling before it, do you think the Buddhist monks set the tone for, for, for the Christian ascetics in years five centuries later? I'm not sure about that, William. I'd have to think about that carefully. And I, I'd, I'd have to look at the evidence. So it's not just a question of you know, the chronology, but the actual evidence of the, the contacts and the nature of contacts and the nature of influence. So that's something I, I, I would need to think a bit about. There are references of, of, of Buddhist monks, well, obviously in Persia, but also in Alexandria, reaching um, from the Red Sea, reaching, reaching certainly Egypt. But whether they uh, influenced the Judean ascetics, I don't know. Okay, anyway, interesting, interesting thing to, to at least think about. Um, before we move to your wonderful images, um, just let's talk about goddesses and misogyny. Uh, this again, another contradiction, the idea that you have these, these very powerful goddesses uh, in an Hindu, Buddhist and Jain uh, thought and religion, uh, but also the inevitable dominance of patriarchy. So this is, you know, in the chapters, I've actually taken up uh, certain ideas that ordinary people have about ancient India. And I've tried to show that the reality was much more complex than people might imagine. So goddesses are so perversive, pervasive, so important in all religious traditions in, in, in India, but that coexists, that kind of uh, ability to visualize divinity in feminine form, which is uh, so prominent uh, in ancient Indian religions across the centuries, not only in Hinduism, but also in Buddhism and Jainism, that coexists with societies that were very clearly patriarchal, many of them patrilineal, uh, in which the subordination of women is very apparent. And again, so that's a contradiction. Manu too. Pardon? There in the laws of Manu. Absolutely. The Manusmriti uh, is one of many texts uh, that uh, talks about uh, women's subordination in ways that we would find very problematic today. Uh, and uh, it's been often, it's been seen as a text that <clears throat> has many rather misogynistic statements, though I must say it's a complex text because Manu for all the nasty things he says about women also praises them. But the overall tenor of the text is definitely uh, that women must know their place within the household and must be obedient to men at all points of time in their lives. So th there's no doubt about that. I was very struck when I went, I know you've just come back from looking at those wonderful caves in the Western Ghats. Um, I was very struck on my last visit by how prominent in the early Buddhist caves, in the very, very first uh, caves we have really that are certainly Buddhist from 150 BC, how images not of the Buddha, as you'd expect, or even a symbol of the Buddha, like the turban or, the, or whatever, uh, but yakshis, endless um, gorgeous images of, of incredibly sensuous women hanging off trees and uh, uh, what's going on there? I think that, um, you know, let me, let me just cite Vidya Dehedia's wonderful book on the body adorned. And uh, she's pointed out that one of the most- One listening to this that hasn't, got that book or read it, go out and buy now. It's a the book on ancient Indian art and, and sensuality. I agree, yeah. I agree completely. And, and she talks about how the sensuous body is, is a very important element in 
Indian art across the centuries. And that sensuousness can be seen not only in the voluptuous yakshis, but even in the treatment of kings, of saints, of uh, you know, Buddhas, bodhisattvas. So there is a certain kind of, um, um, I think the yakshis, which are very who are very fascinating, really represent um, uh, fertility interests, fertility concerns, and um, the fact that they're there at Buddhist sites, at Buddhist monastic sites, again, may strike some. I mean, you go to Parla Caves, and, and it's the site, presumably, of celibate monks who, who had vowed not to have sex, and yet the whole of the front of their monastery is filled with what looks like Bollywood film posters of, of, of half-naked women with their arms in the air, many of them actually clearly dancing. Uh, and uh, and hunky chaps standing beside them, looking like sort of the Ritic Roshan of 150 BC. But it's 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 we who are surprised, isn't it? Obviously, the monks who lived in these uh, monasteries did not find it surprising at all. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, let's go on and look at your pictures, uh, Pindu. You've got a wonderful PowerPoint for us, I believe. Uh, I will share the screen, and uh, what I'd like to bring in here. Uh, William, is an important part of this book. You know, after I'd written this book, and by the way, I wrote it during the early months of the pandemic when we had nothing much to do. All you could do was read or, and write. So I wrote it very fast. And Almost every author that has gone on stage has said, this is the book I wrote when I couldn't leave home. <laughs> during the well, this is the book I wrote when I couldn't leave home. After I'd written it, I wanted... I, I, I realized I needed to have images in the book because for me, uh, art is an important part of history and uh, visual sources are extremely um, important in order to convey uh, what ancient Indian culture was all about. So I started feverishly looking for visuals and I just want to share some of the visuals starting with this beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, apsara that adorns the cover of my book. I think I just think she's the most beautiful woman I've, sat I've ever seen. In the Met Museum, gazing at her from every angle, photographing her from every angle. I noticed, I noticed that you were also captivated by this, by this, by this image, by this uh, apsara. So this is, she appears on my cover. And I'm just going to go through some of the images because, you know, images can convey often much more than, than, than words. And when you're talking about things like the sensuousness of uh, element in ancient Indian culture, look at these beautiful images. They, they really uh, bring out the point in a very vivid uh, manner. The yakshi, the, the beautiful, sensuous, voluptuous yakshis at Bharat in this case. Um, I, these, are, these are all images from my book. I love the um, I love their amazingly uh, matted and and fantastically quaffed hair that they have, and the jewelry. Oh, the and jewelry. Just look at that. And Much of it again, you can still see. Pardon. That jewelry again, very much sort of stuff that you still see in in Sundanaga Market today. So. <laughs> so another thing I tried to do in this book, because you know, in this book, unlike all the other books I've written, I wanted to connect very self-consciously. I wanted to show how ancient India created a rich pool of resources that uh, artists uh, across the centuries have drawn on in different ways. So it's ancient sculpture. Here you have Raja Ravi Varma, Shakuntala writing a love letter to the Dushyant, um, beautiful Gandhar uh, sculpture of Siddharth on the verge of enlightenment, uh, being attacked by Mara. And I've in front of, and I love the, the two soldiers tumbling Absolutely. Uh, in, the, in the panel beneath him. That's right. So, you know, artistic representations of uh, renunciation and enlightenment. Here you have a Jain monk. This is a 17th century painting of a Jain monk uh, walking along a river bank. It's so evocative of what renunciation, the, the, the loneliness of the renunciant, in this case, a Jain monk uh, might be like. So th these are the kinds of images. Karei Kal Ammayar is a very famous uh, sculpture, copper alloy sculpture, uh, where I talk about women and women's participation in religion, uh, where I talk about the, the, the saints, uh, Alvar and Nanmar saints. Um, I included this large image. 
extraordinary image of her in uh, in Cambodia last month in in Bante Shre. Um, <laughs> And I had no idea that this 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 particularly Tamil uh, figure, this Tamil saint, had made it to uh, to to Cambodia. I didn't know that either. I must go back to Bante Sri to to track her down there. There's an image of of, of a dancing Shiva, and she's sitting below him, fanged and emaciated. I see. Okay. So this is uh, Gajalakshmi, but uh, she's from Sanchi. So yeah, I've talked in my book about how goddesses traveled across religious boundaries. And this is very clearly Lakshmi seated on a lotus flanked by elephants. And this is from, from the Buddhist uh, monastic establishment at Sanchi. Later, you find the same images, but uh, with in, even in Christian churches in early Kerala, um, extraordinary in travel reality too. Oh, that's interesting. So I also drew on uh, folk art, uh, popular art, uh, just to show that ancient India is not dead and gone and done with, you know, it, it lives on in so many ways and in, 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 it lives on in art of this kind. This is Kali from Kalihat painting, um, this beautiful painting from a folio of the Gita Govinda, um, 18th century, Radha pining for Krishna. Oh, I, I think these visuals bring ancient India alive. They brought these this series together in the uh, in Zurich last year at the at the Rietberg, the entire uh, the tower of that Gita Govind. Um, uh -huh. uh, wonderful thing it reassembled. Right, and in the chapter on goddesses, I came right up to the idea of India, Bharat Mata. Okay, the idea of nation as goddess. I mean, we need to be able to contextualize what we see around us uh, with the larger kind of trajectory of uh, the importance of goddess worship in India. So these are some of the images that you'll find in the book, the fact that the Mahabharat is not uh, just the Sanskrit Mahabharat, but that there are Mahabharat and Ramayan traditions that continue to be dynamic and evolve and exist in so many different ways across the centuries in different parts of, of the world. Um, one of the things I really loved doing was to look for images of people talking to each other, discussing things. And I found a few images. This is monks and laity listening to the Buddha preaching. I found an image from my own collection, sages deep in conversation. When you start looking for these uh, images, you find them. So, you know, they, they, these are some of the things that I- Festival this year on the, uh, the Karasanata temple, um, and, uh, fantastic. I see. And finally, I end my book with something that means a great deal to me. And that is the way in which contemporary Indian artists have used ancient India as a resource for these fabulous works of art they've produced, these masterpieces. Here you see Neelima Sheikh's Akka. This is based on Akka Mahadevi. You see Arpita Singh's Whatever Is There, this wonderful painting based on the war that is going on uh, at Kurukshetra with uh, Dhritarashtra uh, in the middle and Sanja with binoculars uh, trying to see what's going on uh, on the battlefield, superimposed on a map of the country. I find this is an amazing painting. And another one of my favorites by one of my favorite contemporary Indian artists, A. Ramachandran's vision of war, where you can see the headless Kanishka statue uh, appearing in three different receding forms on the right of, of the image. So, you know, I've tried to talk about, you know, all these different things, try to uh, enliven ancient India. It's add, and also to try to identify certain contradictions, which to me seem to be central uh, to ancient Indian culture, but also I think are contradictions that exist in India even today. And I'm hoping that this way of looking at ancient India will somehow um, make uh, ordinary readers think deeply uh, and understand um, the complexities or, and the wonders of ancient India. Thank you so much, Upinda. Uh, most wonderful 45 minutes. Uh, I'm much looking forward to discussing this with you again. You must come back in person to the festival next year. I'll, I'd love to do that. Thank you so much, William. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye.